TRW uh, back here with a gleam of bayonets. Battle of Antietam, Great Battles of the American Civil War. Um, some things to say. Um, right, so first of all, some more reading. Um, some more reading online. Um, different places, and then especially um, Consum World Forums. The uh, results of that are that I am even more interested in, in getting into this system. And, and in particular, um, finding out what the what all the um, what all the opinions are um, behind this game, um, largely very positive. Um, just finished watching a couple of videos um, from one of the. Um, I'm one of the very prolific uh, videographers of wargaming, um, and he's playing one of the games in this series, and definitely reminded me that um, what I want to do, what I like to do, what I intend to do here, it's an exploration of the game, especially if you've never played like me. Um, and it's... Uh, Primarily to show how the game is played because I still don't see videos that that actually show how to play um, To use you know the, the, the landmark title terrible swift sword um, I Could watch all those videos out there that I found for TSS slash great battles of the American Civil War and I still would not know how to play terrible swift sword if somebody handed me the box and that's what I am most interested in seeing and can't find. How does the game actually play? Um, yeah. Um, so now what am I doing in particular here? Um, for, for a couple of reasons, I coming back to a gleam of bayonets. Um, yeah, two things. One, I went ahead and picked up a, a deployment here. Again, again, I found a good historical map of the battle. I found w Wolford's Brigade. I found... was that... Um, um, Gibbon, Gibbon's Brigade. And... Um, uh, Patrick's. Brigade. Oh yeah, their units were mixed up. That's what I found on my map anyways. So I set them up on the map here per what I found from the historical map. This has nothing to do with what's provided in the game. Although, I did this before, didn't I? I'm curious to how far off. 1319, 1319. See, 13... 19 is just right. 1319 is just right over here. So within what? One, two, three, four, five hexes. And again, I think it's, well, it might be a timing thing. Um, within five hexes. Let's see how I did over here. Let's take the, uh, let's take the 23rd New York. 3219. Oh, geez. That was way off. What the? <laughs> Alright, never mind. That's way off. Um, now I'll try one more. Let's take the 19th. 19th Indiana. What time? What time of the morning are they? 29... 20. Oh, that's way off. 
way off. Yeah, um, this could be, this could be like an hour earlier. Yeah, so these positions, that's what it probably is. Actually, I'm going to guess that that is what it is. That the game starts about an hour earlier than the maps I've been looking at. And I'll bet you they marched from over there on, um, uh, yeah, they marched from there. Okay, anyways, it's still fun for me to, uh, to take them from a historical map. This is what I've got here. Um, and, oh yeah, that's one. So one, I, I'm just, I'm taking formations using a historical map to set them up for my own starting places, starting positions. The other thing I want to do here is, I'm going to, I, not only am I setting aside the A Gleam of Bayonets rule set, the exclusive rule set, I actually, I actually put it back in the box and set the box aside, so I don't even have it out. I'm, I'm only using the standard rules um, that came in my box anyways, um, and I'm going to use the I'm going to use the um, charts and tables that come in the back of the the standard rule set that I have for uh, Gleam of Bayonets because I want to explore first and get familiar with these first um, without, I guess, the distraction of the of the game specific or exclusive rules. So that's what I'm going to do. So. It's a situation I pulled from historical map using just the standard rules, series rules. That's what I'm going to do. want to get a handle on this, um, the, the base design, because um, there are lots of comments about the series, and of course there are many comments about the particular games, and so I think I want to Again, be, get some familiarity with that this uh, base uh, design. Okay. Um, again, this is an exploration. Um, I want to want to take a look at command first. Um, okay, command points uh, rating. Command points rating. Each division commander. Um, oh, not sure I have a division commander. Well, um, hmm. Well, command points rating. Each uh, division commander has a number of command points each game turn. Command points are expended to increase the effective rate. This is what I was looking for. I saw this in I saw this another place, and I thought it was fascinating. And then when I started playing the game here recently, I didn't see it, but I see it. I guess it applies to the division commanders, and I've not been looking at the division commanders. Um, um, com okay, division commanders. All right, which is which? Leader. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the division leaders have the two numbers. Okay. That, uh... Alright, that must be how that goes. I was wondering about that. But that's cool. Very, very cool. To uh, increase the effective uh, effectiveness radius of brigade commanders subordinate to that division commander, one point is expended for each hex added to the effectiveness radius of a brigade command. So these are brigade commanders here. Yeah, on both sides, okay. Um, thus a commander with a total of two command points could increase effective, effectiveness radius of one brigade commander by two or two brigade commanders by one. I like that a lot. I, I like that a lot. And I don't think I've ever seen that. That, and I'm not going to stop and pause here, but just that little rule gave me all sorts of ideas for how command, command emanating from a, from a leader, 
which you don't have to have command emanating from leaders, but even if you have command emanating from leaders, there are other ways to do that um, that maybe haven't been explored much, if at all. Um, command divisional divisional integri integrity radius. A numerical rating of each division commander, which represents the range and hexes over which that division commander may command his subordinate brigade commanders. As long as a brigade commander is within his division commander's radius in the initial command phase, he may move freely in the subsequent movement phase. Okay. Effectiveness rating? Uh, radius. <laughs> Keep one wanting to miss. Let's read that. Uh, a number rating which measures the relative ability of each brigade commander to control his troops. Okay, now we're to the brigade commanders. Um, let's take a look at Wolford here. Again, Wolford. Um, effectiveness rating 4, rally rating 1, and divisional integrity radius of 4 in parentheses. Alright, so... Okay, oh, effectiveness radi radius. Um, effectiveness radius is given in terms of hexes. The higher the number, the greater the distance over which that brigade commander can effectively control his troops. So this is relevant, I guess, because Wolford is here, and he's got a regiment up here, three hexes away. Looks like his effectiveness radius is four. Um, note that the, that the division commanders have no effectiveness radius. Uh, in command, a unit is considered to be in command relative to a particular leader when it is either within that leader's effectiveness radius or in the same hex with that leader. Note that a unit will generally be in command of the leader to which that unit is subordinate, but, but that this is not necessarily true. Okay, rally rating. Okay, we have that rally rating like Wolford's one there. Um, this is the number of units in a brigade commander's effectiveness radius, which he can rally in a given final command phase, in addition to any that are in the same hex with him. Okay. Thus, if a brigade commander had a rally rating of two, he could rally two units of his command, which are within his effectiveness radius, in addition to any stacked with that brigade commander. I like that. Um, all right. Initial command phase. Um, the phasing player. Phasing player. Okay. Um, and detach brigade. Uh, may attach and detach brigades, which are in the divisional integrity radius of a division commander. Um, um, in addition, the player checks the divisional integrity radius to determine which brigade commanders are in command. Division commanders may expend command points to increase the effectiveness radius of supporting brigade commanders. So I guess this is where maybe if Wolford's first Texas was over here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, hexes away from and outside of his command effectiveness radius, and then Wolford's division commander, I guess it's Hood, could expend uh, one of these command points to increase Wolford's radius to five and take in the first Texas so that they are in in uh, they're in in command. Rally phase. Um, pin markers are removed from the phasing player's units. The phasing player may rally his routed units, which are stacked with leaders or in the so that's what it okay, in, in the effective effectiveness radius of their brigade commander. A die rolled is to determine whether or not independent units. A die is rolled to determine whether or not independent units rally. Okay. Final command phase. Friendly leaders that have been killed are replaced and leader promotion is performed if necessary. Uncrewed supply wagons may be recrewed during the final combat, uh, command phase. Game functions that occur only in the given game as described in the exclusive rules are performed. Movement of routed units and units not in command 
A routed unit or unit which is out of the effectiveness radius of its brigade commander may move one hex only, regardless of train costs. And then brigade commanders which are out of the divisional integrity radius of their division commander may move um, only one hex, regardless of train, unless they have been detached. And that sounds like a significant reason for having the whole detachment mechanism. A unit that is outside the effectiveness radius of its brigade commander and not stacked with it with a division commander in the initial command phase may not change its formation during the ensuing friendly movement phase, although it could move one hex in some cases. Um, the Zocks of the... Okay, mounted cavalry exerts a Zock into all six adjacent hexes. The Zocks of these units affect withdrawal, retreat, supply, and command. And command. Um, a wagon may be recruited if its crew has been eliminated by moving an infantry unit or dismounted cavalry unit onto the wagon and removing one strength point from that unit during the friendly final command phase. A unit may retreat before melee regardless of whether or not it is in command. Uh, rally. Okay, again rally. Routed units remain routed until they are rallied in a friendly rally phase. Um, you see, non-independent units, non-independent units, so subordinate units, so to speak, except batteries, are rallied under the following circumstances. One, they are stacked with any friendly leader. Oh uh, yeah, this is the series rules. Um, or two, they are within the effectiveness radius of the brigade commander for that unit, and, and that brigade commander expends a rally point to rally that unit. All right. It's another way of looking at this mechanism mentioned before. Um, leadership. For combat units and brigade commanders to function at their full potential, they must be under the command of their immediately superior leader. Um, leadership affects the ability of these units to move, engage in melee combat, and engage in offensive fire. Okay. In the initial command phase, the phasing player examines his brigade commanders to determine which are in the divisional integrity radius of their division commander. Okay. So... So maybe I will dig out the division commanders here for this uh, exploration.